This is John Darren for Investors Daily. Our guest on Investing to Win is three-time U.S. Investing Championships winner, David Ryan. Mr. Ryan is a portfolio manager with William O'Neill and Company and a student of Mr. O'Neill's stock selection methods. In winning the U.S. Investing Championships for 1985, 86, and 1987, Mr. Ryan swept the field with an astounding three-year net gain of 1,379%. In a minute, we're going to find out how David Ryan accomplished that feat and how he goes about selecting the stocks he buys. So you may want to have a pad and pencil handy for taking notes. But first, David and I were talking about how he got started in the business on the way to the studio this morning, and it is a fascinating story. David, would you mind repeating it for our listeners? Yes, uh, back when I was about 13 years old, my dad brought home that other business newspaper on a, on a daily basis, and I was going through it one night, and I found a $1 stock. And, and I asked my dad, I said, look, if I run into my room, go in my drawer, and find uh, a dollar, can, can we buy this stock tomorrow? And he said, no, it doesn't really work that way. You, that's not how you investigate the market. That's not how you pick a stock. What you do is you have to really do some research, find a company that's maybe growing and uh, doing something a little bit different than other, other companies. So a few days later, he brought home that same paper, and we found an article uh, about a company that was turning itself around. It was called Ward's Foods. I think it was traded on the American at the time. And what they produced was candy. So it was, it was perfect. At that time, I was 13, and that's just about all I was doing is eating a lot of candy. So we ended up buying 10 shares of that stock. And when I'd go into a drugstore or into a supermarket, I had either had to buy a bit of honey or a chunky candy bar. So the company would make more money and the stock would go way up. But it didn't really work that way. That We got into the 74 bear market and stock went from 10 to 4 and two or three years later it came back. And I ended up breaking even on the stock. But it's how I started. That's how I started really getting fascinated with the stock market. And then I started reading books. I started going to seminars. I went to a few seminars that Bill O'Neill gave. And anything I could get my hands on about the stock market, I, I devoured. And I, I got into the point where I think at about 16 or 17, I had a trial subscription to uh, Daily Graphs. And I started using that product and, and just kept on studying the market as I went through high school and, and as I went through college. And finally, when I graduated from UCLA, I decided, I said, hey, if, if I'm so interested in the market and I know the products that William O'Neill and company puts out, why don't I work for them? So I just, uh, I decided, I just, I ran right up the front stairs of the company. I went to the receptionist and I said, who can I talk to about a part-time job, an internship, anything? All I want to learn is, is how William O'Neill picks stocks, how he makes so much money in the market. I started out on a part-time basis. He, he, he decided to hire me. I was in the door and I had access to information and I was, I was on my way to really studying and, and seeing how O'Neill picks stocks. So I was, I was really in uh, just a perfect surrounding, perfect setting, and, and I just really took advantage of it and just started studying and bringing material home and reading more and more and more and, until I started, uh, started really doing a lot better in the stock market. Well, now that you're an expert and an acknowledged success in the market by virtue of your wins in competition, maybe we can pass some information along to our listeners here that will help them hopefully reach that kind of yeah. stature as well. Let's start with, the, with the, the kind of money that's necessary. How much money do you need to really start investing in the stock market? I, I don't think you really need too much. I would say you could probably start with maybe $500, $1,000. You can start small, and then if you're working, you can keep on contributing to your, uh, to your portfolio of stocks and uh, building it up. You can do the same with an IRA. Start with, I guess, uh, you can make a, a, as small a contribution to your IRA as possible and start investing in the market that way. But it's amazing how, how well you can do if you start compounding your money, if you start getting some very nice returns each year, that small amount of money can really build itself into a very substantial amount. So it, you can start small, but uh, try never to, to really pull money out of that account and to buy a, a car or something like that. Try to leave it alone and, and try to live uh, and pay your bills from your income, from uh, other sources of uh, income. So it's not get rich quick, it's get rich 
slowly right. and surely. Right. Too many people, I think, get into the stock market with the attitude is that I'm going to make a killing this year. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make so much money uh, that it, it's going to happen very, very quickly. But it's it, it's very hard to get very substantial returns in the market. It's it's much better to take a yeah, slower, consistent approach. Maybe set a goal of 25 percent a year and see if you can achieve that. Do you think a lot of people have possibly forgotten the intention of the stock market in that you're supposed to become a partner with the company? Yeah, they. Yeah. Th too many people are looking at a short term and not really looking long term, setting sort of long term goals and, and believing that they're buying a piece of this company that's going to grow for the next five or ten years. It's, you know, what can I get in the next quarter or how much can I make in the next six months? It's, uh, they sort of have to change your thinking. And I think Bill O'Neill has said a number of times where he's made his biggest money is when he's taken a uh, taken a position in a stock and held it for four or five years. There are a lot of methods, <clears throat> not all of them work obviously. How did you select the one that does work for you? Well, the the method I uh, I use is the same that uh, William O'Neill uses in that uh, we're looking for growth companies, uh, companies that have a new product, something a company that's doing something differently. And the way, I'll, I'll go back, the way he came up with the method of uh, selecting stocks is that he did a study of the greatest winning stocks of the last 30 years and looked at these companies right before they made major moves, before their stocks went from $25 a share to $150 a share, and sort of isolated all the characteristics these companies had before they made those moves. And and isolated them and brought them down into this can slim, these can slim characteristics. The companies he looked at were stocks like Syntex and Dome Petroleum, uh, Fleetwood, McDonald's, uh, companies that uh, that have been very, very successful. And these can slim characteristics are six or seven points that are the most important that you should be looking at when you're investing in a stock. Can Slim is an acronym, of course, for the method that you and William O'Neill use. Can we go through that point by point and explain it for the audience? Yeah, the, the reason why we picked the name Can Slim is because it's a an easy acronym to remember as you're going through looking for things to uh, to look for in a stock that you might buy. Be before I get to the C, lots of times I like to start with the annual earnings. Mm -hmm. Because when you're looking at annual earnings, you're looking for a consistent company, somebody who over the last five years can, has made money in a good economy or a bad economy. Because the reason why we take a, we look at a five-year period of time, and, and it's a five-year growth record, and that five-year growth record has got to be up at least 25 percent. So the company is growing 25 percent a year for the last five years. The reason why we take five years is because in a normal economic cycle, you have about two and a half years of a good economy, maybe a year, a year and a half of a recession. So if a company continued to grow during a slow period, then you know you've got a company that's got a good product or a good service. So a growth rate of at least 25 percent for the last five years. Then to make sure that growth rate is continuing, then you look to the current earnings, the C in the can slim formula. In the, in the, in the current earnings, you were looking at the last two quarters of earnings, and they also have to be up at least 25%. Now, 25% is very good. When I'm buying stocks, I'm looking for increases of even greater than 25. The, the stronger, the better. If I can find a company that has earnings increases uh, for the past three or four quarters up 50, 75, 100%, that's, that's even a stronger conviction. It gives me stronger feeling for the company that they're doing really a good job. Then after the after the current earnings, then I, I go down to N, which stands for new, something new that the company is doing, either a new product, a new service, and new can also stand for new highs. First going back, going to a product, uh, going back to 1981, I bought a, a video recorder, and I was one of the first people uh, that I knew that had a video recorder, and I read somewhere in a uh, magazine that video recorders were going to outsell TVs by about two to one in the coming years. So I said, well, I have to find a company that sells video recorders, either sells them or makes them. Now, I looked at Sony, and Sony was too big of a company. I looked at RCA, and I think they made video recorders, but video recorder sales were not going to have that big of an impact on their bottom line because they were such a gigantic company. So I found a company on the East Coast, which I had never even heard of. It was called Wards. 
They recently changed their name to Circuit City. They sold electronic products, and they sold video recorders along with a lot of other things. The stock had the CanSlim characteristics I was looking for. It had a new product, a new concept, something that was really starting to get hot in the market. And I picked up that stock, and I think since that, since the early 80s, that stock has increased by about 10 times. Now, I haven't held it the whole way, but I really made some very good money off that one company. So that's what you want to really look for when you're looking for a company that's some, something new, a, a new product or a new service. You mentioned the N stands for a new product or service, and also highs. What do you mean by highs, David? Well, it's when a stock is making a new high in price. The longer the new high, the better. I mean, if it's an all-time new high, that's that's the strongest situation you you can be in. The most difficult thing about buying stocks for new uh, at new highs for people is that in America, it seems like we've been trained that the concept of investing in the stock market is to buy low, sell high, and in everything, and in real estate, buy low, sell high. But I kind of turn it around, and I look at stocks right as they're going into new high ground. I buy high, but I sell even higher. One way you can look at it is if a stock's going to make a move from $25 a share to over $100 a share, it's got to be making a new high every eighth of a point on the way up. What you want to do is try to find it as it's first going into that first new high. Another advantage about buying stocks in new highs is that there aren't any people ahead of you or who have bought at higher prices. There, there's no sellers above you. When a stock goes into a new high, everybody's happy because everybody has a profit. It's not, uh, it's not like you bought at 25 and there's somebody who bought at 30 about six months ago who is just waiting for that stock price to get back to 30 so they could sell out and, and break even. Everybody's happy. Everybody's making money. So there's a lot less resistance for the stock to, to move up in price. So buying low doesn't always mean buying a depressed stock, but finding an aggressive stock that's on the upswing. Right. You, and you want that aggressive stock to be very close to new highs and going on the way up. So I, I never buy at new lows, and I'll probably never sell exactly at new highs. I sort of get the middle 50% of a stock's move. As it, go, as it goes into new highs, and then as it starts down from its old highs, well, that's, that's where I sell out. But that's a, a point that we'll get to a little bit later. It pays not to be greedy sometimes, then. Right, right. Because it's, I think when you try to pick a bottom, you try to pick a top, I think it's just guesswork. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very hard to do. Okay, we've covered the CAN, current earnings, annual earnings, and uh, new product or service. And those earnings, both current and annual, at 25% or better. Right. And then we're looking for a new product, new service, or, as you just indicated, a new high in that stock's upward trend. Yes, yes. Let's move on to the slim portion of this and uh, the rest of the formula. The S stands for shares outstanding. And we found that when we did the study of the greatest winners, that the the greatest winning stocks usually had, at the beginning of their moves, about 5 million shares outstanding. They were smaller, medium-sized growth companies. Now, lately, as new issues have come out into the market, new companies have gone public, they've been coming out with a lot more shares outstanding. They already issue 20 million shares or so. So I would take that characteristic or those parameters of 5 million and look for companies that have shares outstanding under 30 million shares. Today's market, those are the companies that are the smaller, medium-sized growth companies. But when you start getting into companies that have 100 million shares, 200 million shares outstanding, they're usually big, mature companies. And to move that stock one point is it takes a lot of money, a lot of power, a lot of institutions buying that stock. And it, it, it takes a lot more power than it does uh, a company that only has two, three, four million shares outstanding. So look for companies that have a smaller capitalization, smaller shares outstanding. One other thing in the S under shares is also look at how many shares your stock trades in a day. Look at the average daily volume. And in, in Investors Daily, we have a figure that shows you the percentage increase or decrease in the shares traded in a day versus the previous five or six weeks. So you can see if the demand has picked up for your company or if it's dropped off. When a stock is rising in price, you really want to see that stock increase its volume, especially when the stock is going into new high ground. You want the demand to really pick up and the increase in volume to be at least 50% over its average. 
going to the L in CanSlim, L stands for a leading stock. When you're looking at a leading stock, a good way to find it is by looking in Investor's Daily. For every stock in our paper, we've got a relative strength figure. And all that relative strength figure does is compare how the price of your company is performing versus every other company in the market. It's from 1 to 99, 99 being the strongest. The majority of companies that I'm buying have a relative strength of at least 80. Most of the companies I'm looking at are outperforming just about every stock in the market, and they have relative strengths in the 90s, 99, 98, 97. A lot of people come up with the argument of, well, the stock's already been performing very, very strongly over the past six months. It's, it can't get any stronger. Well, you have to remember that this is a figure, it's a relative figure of how that company is performing versus the other companies in the market. So just because it has a relative strength of 99 doesn't mean the stock can't go higher. A good example that I've got is I was on Financial News Network back in the last trading day of December 1986. I came on the show and I had two stocks that I was presenting going over the companies. One was Microsoft, it had a relative strength of 99. One was Zare Corporation, had a relative strength I think in the 40s or 50s. The very next year in 1987, Microsoft tripled in price. Zare Corporation, I think, moved down or continued sideways. Really didn't make any price progress. So you can see that just because Microsoft had a relative strength of 99, didn't prohibit it from tripling in price the very next year. Also, when you're looking at a leading stock, you want to make sure that you're in a leading group, that the company you own is in a very strong group. When Microsoft was moving, it was in the top-rated, top-ranked groups that, that we follow. And in Investors Daily, there are about 200 industry groups that we follow. And you want to do your, a majority of your buying in the top 50, the top 25% of all groups. Because when a stock makes a move, a very strong move, it usually occurs when it's one of the hottest groups in the market. So make sure you've got a leading stock and that that leading stock is in one of the strongest groups. Moving to I for institutional sponsorship. Institutions make up about 80% of the volume in today's market. They've got a lot of money, a lot of buying power. And they're the ones that really power a stock higher. So when you're buying a stock, you have to make sure it has some institutional sponsorship. At least 1% or 2% of the stock is owned by mutual funds. Lots of times when I buy stocks and they're just beginning their moves, they have very, very little sponsorship because not too many people will follow them or they don't know about these smaller growth companies. As the stock goes higher, more and more institutions buy it. The stock moves higher and higher and higher. By the time I get to the point where I'm just about to sell a stock, the stock has sponsorship of about 25 or 30 percent. Once you get over 30 percent, you probably have a little bit too much sponsorship, and that and these institutions then can be a source of supply, knocking the stock down if they start selling. So institutional sponsorship is good, uh, but it's the amount that you have to keep an eye on. And in daily graphs, I think we've got a figure for every single stock. We show how much of that stock is owned by institutions. So it's a good source, a good place to look for that. The last point in Can Slim is the general market. M stands for market. What is, uh, what is the market doing? Are you in a bull market or are you in a bear market? I use a lot of different things to help me in calling the market. A majority of that comes from how are my individual stocks are doing. If I've got four or five stocks and they're all starting to move down, they're starting to, to break points of uh, where I'm starting, where I should be selling them. It gives me a very good clue of, of that the market is not performing very well, and the stocks that that I'm buying and the, the characteristics of stocks that I've described are of companies that are leaders in the market. And if they start performing poorly, then you know you're getting into a very tough market environment. That's my biggest clue. A few other things I look at: I analyze the daily Dow. I look I look for the uh, how the Dow is ad advancing and on what kind of volume. I look to see if it's above its 200-day moving average. I, few, I use a few uh, momentum indicators that I keep myself, very, very simple type of momentum indicators. But I combine all these different factors in to give me a very good uh, idea of which way the market is going. But most of it, again, stems from what are my stocks doing? Are they going up or are they going down?
Let's recap again for our listeners a little bit the Can Slim formula, current earnings, annual earnings, new product, service, new highs in the stock performance. And the Slim portion shares outstanding. And you uh, say we should look for a company that has essentially 5 million shares. Right. Uh, beyond that, it, uh, it's a little bit too, uh, too hard to track. Well, ideally, if you can find a company that has about 5 million shares or maybe a little bit less, that's the best situation. You can go as high as 30 million shares. But once you start getting you know, 40, 50, mm. 100 million shares, it's just too much of stock uh, to, to move. And we want a leading stock in a sector or in a particular industry. Right. And uh, institutional sponsorship, if, if the, uh, the professionals are looking at this stock, uh, then obviously they've done their research and that indicates it's a uh, stock of choice. Yeah, if, if a company doesn't have any institutional sponsorship, then, then either these institutions have looked at it and they see that there's nothing worth buying here mm -hmm. or the company is just too small or it's just not uh, you know, worth purchasing. So some institutional sponsorship gives you some conviction uh, in your purchase. But there's a delicate balance in there because yes. if too many pick it up, then as you say, it becomes a supply right. and uh, could influence the selling. Now, you watch the, uh, the market in general, obviously, uh, the major indicators. What about the stocks themselves? Do you look at, at the intently at the profile of a stock, at graphs and charts on that particular stock as a tool? Yes. Uh, graphs, I think, is, is something that's very, very important, something that, that investors should use in analyzing a, a stock. Going over these characteristics of what we just talked about, I've had a number of people call me and said, well, you know, I, I've got CanSlim down. I know what to look for. And they've got an idea. They, they know what companies meet these criteria but they don't know how to time their purchase. And timing is probably at least 50% of the equation. So I use daily graphs, I use investors daily to help me out with the exact timing of when I should be buying this company. So I, I, I look to graphs, a one-year graph. If you can get, if you can use a combination, a one-year graph and maybe a five-year graph, that's the best situation. You shouldn't be scared of using graphs or using charts because what graphs are, are they reflect the actual decisions of investors. There are no opinions contained in charts because they show you exactly the price movement of that stock has made. And that movement is made up of individuals' decisions on if they should buy or sell that, that stock. The investment decisions of uh, investors are influenced by fear. Am I going to lose money? Or, or greed, I want to make a lot of money. And these human emotions that these investors have, they, they rarely change. They, they're pretty con uh, constant. And these patterns or these emotions almost show up right in, in the graphs themselves, in, in the daily graphs. And if you can analyze these patterns, uh, then you can get a, a good feeling for which way a stock is going to go. If you combine some of the, the patterns we found that have proven successful with the Canslim characteristics, then you have the most powerful combination. A few patterns that we found have been uh, the most powerful have been a cup and handle formation. Also, there are other things like flat bases. It's just a stock moving sideways. So if you can analyze these, know what to look for, uh, and you combine it with the cancel characteristics, uh, it can really help you out in the timing of the purchase of your security. Please turn to side two.